and challenging times, and I think we will require unprecedented and challenging actions in the days ahead. Coronavirus is without doubt the most serious public health emergency that has faced the world in over a century. People have sadly passed away in Northern Ireland, and we must prepare ourselves, for there will be more. Never before has our National Health Service faced such a looming and fear-provoking crisis. The virus is here, and it will get worse before it gets better. But the actions that we take today, tomorrow, and the days ahead will hugely impact on how many lives will be lost. So as we discuss the objectives of this bill, I would urge members to keep that to the absolute fore of their thinking. I want to also take this opportunity to provide members with an important update on the latest state of play um, in relation to testing. We are currently scaling up testing capacity across our health and social care system. And I am pleased to say that as a result of the actions of staff, the scale, the scale up is progressing at a rapid pace. The most recent update which I received yesterday is that we are now doing, doing over 600 tests per day in the regional virus reference laboratory. This laboratory will be doing 900 tests per day by early next week. Two other trusts will commence testing this week, which will add another 250 tests per day. So that will bring our testing capability to over 1,100 tests per day. I want to say a sincere thanks to all our staff involved in the work to scale up this capacity across our health and social care system. So given the current contacts, the laboratory testing is reserved for a number of priority groups. These are people admitted to hospital, key healthcare workers, and in circumstances relating to the management of outbreak clusters. Key healthcare workers include staff working in emergency departments, critical care units, primary care, and in frontline ambulance staff. These priority groups for testing have been determined following discussion with national experts, scientific and advisory groups. The priority groups for testing are under constant review and are likely to be expanded further as our testing capacity increases. I have established an expert working group to take forward work testing scale-up. We are fully plugged into the national discussions relating to work to scale-up testing for healthcare workers, and I will be able to share more information on this in due course. Mr. Speaker, moving to the issue at hand, you will be aware that it was necessary for me to table an amendment to the motion in order to deal with some recent amendments to the bill which relate to matters which are devolved to Northern Ireland. And it was important to have these clauses reflected in this motion. Whilst I appreciate that this is not an ideal situation, we are operating in unparalleled times, and the coronavirus bill is moving through its various legislative stages at pace. Members will be aware from my previous statements to the Assembly that my department, including the health and social care system, has been planning extensively over the years for an event such as an outbreak of a pandemic. This is to ensure that we are well prepared to respond in a way that offers substantial protection to the public, as has always been the case. My priority as Minister of Health is to ensure that all effective measures continue to be put in place in Northern Ireland. But I would stress that for social distancing measures announced yesterday to work, everyone in Northern Ireland needs to understand clearly that the vast majority of commercial premises must close. Only those providing essential goods and services can stay open. All others must close and close now. Let me be crystal clear about what that means. As the Prime Minister said yesterday, this is not merely guidance or advice. It's an instruction. If it's not heeded, our hospitals will be overrun and many people will die needlessly. If it's not heeded, then we will not hesitate to enforce it with penalties that include an unlimited fine. It is as stark as that. As part of that work, my department and the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales have contributed to the UK-wide Coronavirus Action Plan, which was published by the UK Government on 3 March. The Action Plan highlights the procedures which need to be put in place to delay and mitigate the threat posed by COVID-19. 
Among the suite of measures identified in the action plan is the introduction of a coronavirus bill. This will ensure that the UK has robust, proportionate and effective legislative measures to deal with the impacts of a widespread COVID-19 outbreak. The coronavirus bill was introduced at Westminster on the 19th of March and contains emergency provisions that we need to have at our disposal to deploy only if required. And I want to stress only if required are key words. In situations like this, it is normal and indeed good practice to plan for a reasonable worst case scenario. However, I do want to stress that by preparing for such possibilities, it doesn't mean that we anticipate to expect those results to arise. But if we don't take the actions that we have been instructed to take, they will. From a Northern Ireland perspective, the coronavirus bill is being used to provide relevant Northern Ireland departments with the necessary and proportionate legislative powers to allow them to act in a rapid and effective way to deal with the severe pandemic. Mr Speaker, the bill is regarded as a priority across relevant Northern Ireland departments and ministerial colleagues from a number of departments have provided provisions pertaining to their own remit. Each minister supports me as the Minister of Health in taking forward these provisions on their behalf. In broad terms, the main purpose of the coronavirus bill is to increase the available health and social care workforce by allowing recently retired health and social care staff to come back to work in order to support the efforts to tackle this outbreak. To ease the burden on frontline staff by reducing the number of administrative tasks they have to perform and allowing key workers to perform more tasks remotely and with less paperwork. To contain and slow the virus by reducing unnecessary social contacts, for example, through banning certain mass gatherings and controlling school and childcare closures, and to manage the deceased with respect and dignity, by enabling the death management system to deal with increased demand for its services, and to support people by allowing them to claim statutory sick pay from day one, as well as helping the food industry to maintain supplies. As I have already indicated, the provisions within the Bill cover a broad range of topics that relate to various Northern Ireland departments. For example, the Bill contains measures to help contain and slow the spread of this virus. Provisions in Clause 35 and Part 3 of Schedule 15 to the Bill will enable the Department of Education to give directions requiring the temporary closure of schools, the Department for the Economy to give directions requiring the closure of further and higher education institutions, and the Department of Health to give directions requiring the closure of childcare provision. However, I stress that there is a requirement for the respective departments to have regard to the advice from the Chief Medical Officer before issuing those directions. Clause 36 and Part 3 of Schedule 16 provides for temporary con continuity directions which will allow the relevant departments to issue temporary continuity direction which would require schools, further and higher education institutions and childcare providers to stay open. Again, the respective departments will be required to have regard to advice from the Chief Medical Officer before issuing such directions. The Bill includes powers relating to policing and justice, justice functions, which are intended to alleviate the administrative burdens related to the justice functions in the event that widespread absences related to the spread of COVID-19 actually happen and will happen. They are to reduce the capacity to deliver those functions. Um, for example, Part 1 of Schedule 26 provides powers for courts and tribunals in Northern Ireland to direct and use live links in respect of participation in any court or tribunal proceedings, where the court determines this to be in the interest of justice. Live links can refer to either live audio links or live video links. Another key feature of the Bill is the inclusion of provisions to ease a number of existing legislative and regulatory requirements. Emergency volunteering leave is a new form of unpaid statutory leave. Its purpose is to maximise the pool of volunteers that can be drawn upon during a specific 16-week emergency volunteering period. The volunteers will fill capacity gaps within the health and social care sector and will help to safeguard essential services that are at risk as a result of pressures caused by the pandemic. 
Schedule 6 of the Bill enables the Department of Health and the Health and Social Care Board and any of the Health and Social Care Trusts to identify and certify volunteers by means of an emergency volunteering certificate. Schedule 6 also addresses the two primary deterrents to participation in volunteering. The first is the risk to employment and employment rights, and the second is the loss of income. This provision provides protection for employment and employment rights during, following, or when seeking a period of emergency volunteering through the modification of the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996. In the event of a severe outbreak of COVID-19, the number of people off work is likely to increase significantly. This would include those who are displaying virus-like symptoms, as well as those who are self-isolating as a precautionary measure, in accordance with public health advice. In a potentially reasonable worst-case scenario, it has been estimated that up to one-fifth of employees may be absent from work during the peak weeks. This would clearly present a significant financial burden on employers through increased statutory sick pay costs, so the legislative changes proposed are therefore intended to provide the ability to provide relief to employers, with the current focus primarily being on the small to medium enterprises. The Bill also provides the power for regulations to be made regarding the recovery from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs of additional payments of statutory sick pay by certain employers for absence related to coronavirus. The ability to recover statutory sick pay is important so that employee, employers are supposed, supported in a period when their payment of statutory sick pay are likely to escalate. It is also necessary to ensure that employees are incentivised not to attend work when advised not to do so for reasons of health security. Ordinary statutory sick pay is not payable for the first three days of sickness, which are commonly referred to as waiting days. There is provision in the Bill to allow regulations to be made, which will temporarily suspend waiting days for those employees who are absent from work due to coronavirus. This is only in the event and for the duration of a severe outbreak. Clause 45 of the Bill also makes provision to adjust the pension scheme regulations for retired health and social care staff, which would enable them to return to work for short periods without the loss of pension entitlement. The purpose of provisions at Clause 17 and 20 and Part 3 of Schedule 12 is to relax requirements in relation to certifying deaths and cremations. As members will be aware, there are normally very strict requirements around certifying deaths. These clauses contain some relaxation of some of those requirements in order to cope with expected higher than usual number of deaths and fewer doctors. The principal purpose of these provisions is to enable death registrations to be processed more expeditiously at a time when, regrettably, there may be an additional burden as a result of an excessive number of deaths. In normal circumstances, if an inquest is held in relation to a death in custody, that needs to be held in front of a jury. Clause 29 makes provision to suspend the requirement in Northern Ireland for an inquest to be held with a jury in relation to a death from COVID-19. Clause 30 of the Bill will also enable a coroner to hold or continue to hold an inquest into a death in the prison from natural illnesses without a jury. Mental health legislation exists to provide for the compulsory detention and treatment of patients and mental capacity legislation to ensure that those who are unable to make decisions for themselves are protected against arbitrary decisions. Our laws ensure that these powers are only used when a person is so unwell as to need them and when he or she presents a serious risk to him or herself or others. The law strikes a balance between safely caring for people and protecting their rights. The temporary modifications of the Mental Health Order and Mental Capacity Act at Schedules 9 and 10, respectively, have been, have been deployed with the interests of the person in mind. We must do all we can to ensure the continued and safe running of mental health services and the deprivation of liberty safeguards, and to allow certain flexibilities to be introduced at the point at which they may be required. Mr Speaker, another key aspect of the Coronavirus Bill 
is having measures which will help to enhance the capacity and the flexibility of deployment of staff across essential services. In that respect, the Bill makes provision to allow for the registers for various professions such as nurses, other health professionals and pharmacists to allow temporary registration of people who would not otherwise be eligible for registration. This is to enable gaps in the workforce to be filled. This may be used to enable the readmission of people who have retired or final year students. The power is to, to be exercised with close cooperation between the Department of Health and the relevant register. Clause 12 of the Bill also makes provision to provide indemnities for health and social care activity and allows the Department of Health to indemnify or make arrangements to indemnify persons who are doing jobs that they are not normally covered for within the health service. Mr Speaker, I appreciate that the Bill has to make provision for outcomes that we may prefer not to contemplate, but for what we must be, be, be prepared. This would include measures to ensure that the deceased are treated in a dignified way should we experience an excessive number of deaths as the result of a COVID-19 outbreak. Clause 56 and Schedule 27 of the Bill makes provision for powers of direction in relation to bodies to enable local government to direct private providers in the death management industry, for example, funeral directors, mortuaries and crematoriums, and individuals and services to implement a central plan. Part 1 of Schedule 27 creates powers to require the provision of information about capacity to deal with the transportation, storage and disposal of human remains. Part 2 provides powers to give directions which will require providers to do anything that is calculated to facilitate the transportation, storage and disposal of human remains. And this will include the provision of services, facilities, premises, vehicles and equipment. These powers are intended to improve pro the process through the system at every stage up to burial or cremation. It is also vitally important that we act responsibly in this current situation. And to that end, the Bill seeks to support and protect the public to do the right thing and follow public health advice. For example, Clause 46 and Schedule 17 makes new provisions for powers to deal with public health. It mainly enables the making of regulations by the Department of Health to allow for measures to be introduced to help delay or prevent further transmission of an infection from COVID-19, which presents or could present significant harm to human health. It also gives powers to district judges and magistrates' courts to make orders in relation to people, premises or things on application by the public health agency. These provisions are equivalent to powers that have already been exercised in England and Wales in relation to coronavirus. Clause 49 and um, Part 5 of Schedule 20 provide powers relating to potential infectious persons. These provisions give powers to public health officers, such as officers of the public health agency or anyone acting under their direction under arrangements for dealing with coronavirus. It is important to bear in mind that the powers are ex exercisable only if two safeguards are met. In the first instance, the Department of Health must make a de declaration that COVID-19 is a serious and imminent threat in Northern Ireland, and the public health officer has reasonable grounds to suspect that a particular person is or may be infectious. If so, the public health officer can direct the person to go to a suitable place to undergo screening and assessment or quarantine. Part 5 of Schedule 20 also makes provision for additional powers for the Police Service of Northern Ireland to support actions taken by the relevant health authorities to prevent the spread of coronavirus. These will enable the police to enforce sensible public health restrictions, including returning people to isolation and, where necessary, directing individuals to seek relevant treatment or attend suitable locations for further help. Clause 50 and Part 5 of Schedule 21 to the Bill gives powers to the Executive Office to prohibit or otherwise restrict events or gatherings or to close premises. The reason that these powers are given to the Executive Office is because it is recognised that this may raise cross-cutting issues. Again, it is important to highlight that the powers are accessible in a de declaration to a health threat 
to public health is made by the Executive Office of Advice of the Chief Medical Officer, and the direction is given for the purpose of preventing, protecting against, or controlling the incident or tra transmission of coronavirus, or facilitating the most appropriate deployment of medical or emergency personnel resources in Northern Ireland. Mr. Speaker, Speaker Schedule 21, which Clause 50 refers to, compares powers to issue direction to prohibit or restrict events or gatherings or to close premises or places restrictions on persons entering or remaining in premises. Members, I should make it clear at the outset that these measures are not proposed lightly. The measures are proportionate to the threat we face and need to be used when necessary. Any direction to prohibit, close or restrict events or gatherings or premises can only be issued during the public health response period that we are currently in. And the Executive Office can make these on recommendation of the Chief Medical Officer or any Health Chief Medical Officer at the Department of Health. Members, I appreciate that in the face of these are significant measures that are being proposed. Some may say draconian. A few weeks ago, I would never have thought that I would be speaking in support of measures to curtail the everyday lives of everyone in Northern Ireland. Today, however, I am firmly in the position that they are necessary and proportionate. We all know that social distancing is key to ensuring that our health and social care system is not overwhelmed and that the effects of the outbreak are constrained as far as possible. We have already asked fellow citizens to drastically change their daily lives. These provisions will ensure that we can enforce social distancing when we need to. Members, the stark reality is that without effective social distancing and the measures proposed, we risk overloading our precious health system to the point of collapse and the needless death of fellow citizens. The provisions at Clause 23 to 27 on Schedule 14 confer a power to the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to require those involved in the food industry to provide information relating to a food supply chain. The information gathered will help to effectively support an industry-led response to any food supply distribution disruption resulting from COVID-19 and inform a planned response. Again, it is important to stress that these powers may only be used in the event that the food supply chain disruption or risk of disruption and the person from whom the information is required has not complied with the previous request to provide the information voluntarily. Again, they would only be activated should it become necessary to use them. It is vital that I make clear to members that the coronavirus bill will operate on a time-limited basis and is not intended to remain in perpetuity. It will expire after a maximum of two years unless Parliament considers it necessary to extend it or reduce it. Mr Speaker, I appreciate that members are being asked to consider the legislative consent motion within a very short time frame. However, I know that members appreciate that we are operating in extraordinary circumstances and when taking the steps to have the necessary legislative provisions in place, we are not blessed with the luxury of time. In normal circumstances, I would have preferred members to have had more time to reflect on the bill. However, the fact of the matter is that these are not normal circumstances. And given the nature and speed of the events with which we are dealing, and the need to ensure that Northern Ireland provisions are included in the, in the bill, it has, it has been necessary to expedite the normal process. I also understand that colleagues in Scotland and Wales are working to similarly challenging timescales and trying to obtain consent from the Scottish Parliament and the National Assembly for Wales, respectively. In conclusion, I believe that it is, a, it is critical to have a consistent approach across the whole of the United Kingdom in terms of having a legislative framework which will provide sufficient powers to meet the potential challenges that we may face in having to respond to this pandemic. The coronavirus bill provides for such a consens consistent legislative approach across the United Kingdom. And furthermore, on this occasion, I also, believes, I also believe that it makes practical sense for the UK Parliament to progress legislation dealing with the transferred matters, as it would not be possible to legislate for Northern Ireland separately within a similar timescale. 
Mr. Speaker, I commend the motion and the amendment to the House. Uh, thank you, Minister. And can I now invite you to move formally your amendment? Moved. The, move, the motion and the amendment has now been moved, and I first call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I first take a moment to um, thank sincerely all those on the front line today bearing the burden of this public health crisis on our behalf. They deserve our full support and cooperation as much as our gratitude and admiration. I also acknowledge the enormous efforts and dedication shown by the Minister and his officials in working to address the myriad of challenges posed by this crisis in making uh, regular media appearances and maintaining contact with the committee, which is essential to communicate important messages and ensure public confidence. The Health Committee was briefed yesterday on the health aspects of the Coronavirus Bill and the LCM, including measures in relation to the workforce, mental health and mental capacity, and new powers in relation to public health. The Committee was in no doubt about the urgent need to take responsible action to save lives. We know our health and social care workforce was already under immense strain before this challenge added to the difficulties. Officials advise on measures to facilitate rapid expansion of all sectors by streamlining the registration requirements and protecting pension arrangements of those retired. We were advised, <coughs> excuse me, we were advised that the immediate focus would be on those <coughs> we were advised that the immediate focus would be on those who retired within the last three years, and the next step would be consideration of those who have recently completed training or are currently in pre-registration roles or final year. Members inquired about the likely impact of the measures and were advised that contact was being made with around 500 recently retired medical staff, around 200 pharmacists in addition to other professions. Having raised issues in relation to community pharmacy, members were heartened to learn that greater support for existing community pharmacy workforce is in train in terms of the rollout of PPE and additional funding to respond to greater demand. They were also encouraged to hear that there has been an extremely positive response to the call for pharmacists and other sectors to come forward to help where resources are most needed. We were further advised that provisions for emergency volunteers, including a compensation scheme for loss of earnings, would help encourage further workers into the system. Members are very appreciative of the speedy work to enable this and realise fully that our HSC workforce is our single greatest asset and must be protected and supported as they work to protect and support us. Mr Speaker, turning to the mental capacity and mental health, members inquired about the clauses streamlining decision making where, and were advised that in all cases two persons would be required to make key decisions and that there would remain a right of appeal. It was explained that the streamlining would free up staff resource to focus on urgent care priorities. In terms of public health, the committee further discussed the new suite of powers available under Schedule 17 in terms of public health protection. They noted that before making regulations to avail of the powers, the department would, having consulted the, medical, the chief medical officer, declare a serious and imminent threat to public health and only then exercise powers if they felt to provide an effective means of delaying or reducing transmission of the disease. They were further assured by the that the department would be required to revoke the powers when the situation has passed. Members inquired about the nature of the additional powers, the time periods involved in detaining people for screening or isolation, and were also advised about the right of appeal to magistrates' court. Members raised concern about informal public gatherings at the weekend, which seemed to suggest not everyone had heard the message clearly about social distancing and staying at home where possible. The committee were advised that the bill could address this if necessary for public protection. Since yesterday, of course, we have now seen the Prime Minister take the next step. It was further acknowledged, however, that if public health advice is disregarded and the extra powers are needed, this will be putting additional strain on public services in terms of enforcement. So to summarise uh, the views at yesterday's meeting, members acknowledged the measures in the bill went beyond what they might ordinarily support 
and that the opportunity for scrutiny has been much less than they would ordinarily require. However, these are not ordinary times and require unusual, accent, or unusual action and solidarity. The Health Committee therefore agreed that in these circumstances it was content to support the extension of the relevant provisions of the Coronavirus Bill to this jurisdiction. Finally, in view of the extraordinary measures included, the Committee also agreed that I should represent their support for the amendment in the House of Commons to provide for a six-month review. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'd just like to um, ask to add a few remarks as a DUP health spokesperson. So, Mr Speaker, from a party's perspective, we recognise and fully support measures to increase our pool of doctors, nurses and healthcare workers. The emergency registration of health professionals provided for in clauses 2 and 4 is a necessary step in preempting likely rising staff absence due to the virus and those self-isolating. Equipping our health service with the skills and expertise needed to meet the surge should be our foremost priority. There are, of course, issues in all of this that we must be cognizant of. We are hearing anecdotal evidence from some final year students and trainees struggling with unprecedented pressure of starting their careers in this environment. How will their well-being be safeguarded? How will older returning doctors and nurses be deployed so as not to increase their risk and exposure? Clauses 7 and 8 allow workers to take two, three or four weeks to volunteer in crucial health jobs, i.e. carers or porters without loss of employment rights, and this seems a sensible and measured proposal. We need to utilise all available skills from across our economy and society to meet this major health threat. It is important that crucial sectors providing support to public health response are not unduly weakened. And again, we have the issues requiring clarity. In what sectors will employees be able to take a period of absence? What training will be made available for volunteers of this kind? I would value some clarity on these issues. We welcome support and powers given to mental health workers, and we stand with them as they take such responsibility on their shoulders. I think it's of vital importance that there are provisions around indemnity. We are asking people to step outside their areas of specialism, and we need to provide them and their trusts with security as they do so. Regarding registration of deaths and stillbirths, clauses 17 and 20 relax certifying requirements. This proposal illustrates the scale of the threat of coronavirus and the likely impact in terms of fatalities. And Mr Speaker, it is important that morgues are not overwhelmed or supported by other service providers where possible, whilst ensuring vital doctor and nursing time is spent in the most beneficial areas rather than with bureaucracy. There are, of course, other aspects I'd like to raise, but I am conscious my colleagues will raise some in their contributions, and we must use our time in this chamber in a very focused way. Mr Speaker, we live in very uncertain days, and the nature and detail of this bill reflects this. It is a startling piece of legislation. It is a sobering piece of legislation, and it's a frightening piece of legislation. Sadly, however, it is also a piece of legislation that is necessary. Mr Speaker, coronavirus, COVID-19, is changing our world before our very eyes. What was normal is now exceptional or impossible. What we took for granted is now uncertain, and for how long, we simply do not know. Our constituents are frightened. I am frightened. Frightened for my husband, for my children, my parents, my mother-in-law, for my sister-in-law in the ICU unit, for wider family, friends, staff, colleagues, for this wee country which I love so much. But like anyone, when frightened, we look to others for reassurance, to the Prime Minister, to our First Minister, to our Deputy First Minister, to our Health Minister, to us as elected representatives. The onus is on all of us to take all steps necessary to provide this reassurance. I believe this legislation will enable us and empower us to do this. It is necessary, but let us all hope and pray that many of the provisions in it are never needed. Thank you. Thank you, and I call John O'Dowd. Gormay uh, can call you, and it's quite clearly uh, 
a very difficult time for our communities, our families uh, and society. In normal times, I would be rising to speak against this legislation and how we are processing, as I suspect many in the Chamber would be. This is not how we do business. This is not how we uh, should be doing legislation, but we are not in any way in normal times. I too am frightened. I am six foot six and 18 stone on a good day. I am terrified of a virus I cannot see, um, I cannot hear, but I know it is everywhere around us. And I know it poses the greatest single threat to my family, my neighbours, uh, my community, and I mean my community, I mean all the people who live here, that we have ever faced in our lifetime, and will likely ever face in our lifetime. And those sentiments will be repeated time and time again across the chamber, and people will be quite sincere when they say that. But the unfortunate matter is this. There are people out there who are not listening. There are people out there who, either out of bravado or stupidity, ignorance or arrogance, are continuing to flout the advice that has been given to them to protect their own lives and the lives of those people around them. And when their loved ones are choking to death in an ICU unit, if they are lucky enough to get a ventilator, then it is too late to say, I am sorry, or I did not know, or I thought it would happen to someone else. It is far, far too late. Now is the time, and in fact, I think we are past the time, but we are on the right road now. Uh, we are on the right road now to help prevent many, many deaths. So again, I would appeal to, appeal to those people who are flouting the restrictions who are putting others in danger to stop it now before they are standing. And they won't be standing in the ICU unit because they'll have to stand outside. Their loved ones will die alone because they will not be allowed in to hold their hand or comfort them or be with them at their last moments. They will be their, their loved ones and the loved ones of others will die alone. So I appeal to them once again to do the right thing. And if they don't do the right thing, then enforce the legislation that is before us today. Uh, I was coming into the Assembly this morning, as, as we all have, and in my humble opinion, there is still far too much traffic on the road. There are far too many people about. That cannot be all essential workers. Now, many of those people in those vehicles may have be saying, well, my employer will not let me stay off work, will not allow, allow me to work from home. I say to those employers, you are putting the lives of your employees in grave danger if you do not if you do not allow those either to stop work or work from home. We will lose businesses as a result of this pandemic which is going around the world. We will lose jobs. We will lose livelihoods. All those can be rebuilt again. All those will receive support to be rebuilt again. The entire economy of the globe will have to be reshaped to rebuild an economy to create jobs. But we will not be able to bring one employee or one loved one back from the death they will face if we do not take the actions outlined or if employers do not take the actions that are outlined in this. In terms of the response, Concordia, um, I just want to quote from the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control on the 11th of March. The early Decisive, rapid, coordinated and comprehensive implementation of closures and quarantines is likely to be more effective in slowing the spread of the virus than a delayed implementation. As I said, there has been much said about delayed implementation, but we are where we are now and we are taking measures to do so. But the other measure we have to take is we have to test, test, test. We have to know where the virus is, who has the virus, and word is spreading. One of the concerns I have when I listen to the evening news or, or the broadcasts, when journalists, uh, who are, many of whom are, are doing a fine job at this time, uh, report the figures for that day. There's 20 new cases today, or there's 15 new cases today. Uh, it doesn't reflect what is happening of the spread of this virus. The virus is out there. 
It's in every community, in every village, in every estate, in every town land. Uh, it's being spread by people who maybe don't know they have symptoms or careless people who have symptoms and are being out. So I think there, there needs to be a health warning with every time we announce the number of people who have confirmed cases. At the minute, it stands on the island of Ireland around 1,275. In the north here, I think it's around 148 at, at, at this stage. But as I say, that health news comes with a health warning. It does not reflect the spread of the virus. It does not reflect the danger that our communities face and our families face. What we need is more testing. And I welcome the Minister in, in his opening remarks said that we are moving uh, to a greater number of testing. But I still think we even need more than that. We need to be opening up testing centres. We need to be cooperating across the island of Ireland. We need to cooperate across these islands. We need to be cooperating across Europe because this virus knows no borders. So the, the response is commensurate to the crisis. Um, the response is needed. The legislation is needed. The way the legislation is being introduced is needed. And what is needed more than anything is for citizens to understand the danger they face. Uh, I, I'll end, I, just, I just want to, in terms of, of the amendment, Minister, the amendment to me is, is very far reaching uh, and it quite literally is a blank checkbook. Um, and that, the legislator in my head, alarm bells rings when I see things like this. But the, the alarm bell that's ringing in my head about the danger we face is much, much more louder. I just maybe in terms of his closing remarks, the, the, the minister might explain the rationale behind that amendment. I think I understand it, but I think it's just for the record, it would be worth uh, putting that. And can I end then by just putting on record again our appreciation and indeed our admiration of all those who are working in our health service, whether they be a consultant or whether they be a cleaner, a catering staff or nurse or whatever they may be. I, we, we owe them a huge amount. And at the end of this process, we need to remember we owe them uh, a huge amount. We need to get them the proper equipment. And I, I welcome the fact that uh, quite quickly the O'Neill's factory was brought into play. That shows the thinking we need now. Uh, where, where, where ministers and the executive acted quickly. They, they, they've seen an opportunity, they've seen a solution, and they went after it, and they got it. I also want to congratulate and thank those who are working in the supermarkets and shops and producing food for us. Um, it, has to, it has to be nerve-wracking standing behind the counter, facing all those people coming, um, transacting money. And, you know, you're, you're, they're placing themselves at risk for not great money either. So I think at the end of this process, we need to remember those people too, because there will be an end to this process, uh, and, and life will go back to normal again, as we're seeing in China, and hopefully the Chinese experience, what they have been through, will help uh, the Western world to move forward. There is hope at the end of this, and we need to remember those people who stood by us when we were there. But I'll end on this note. Uh, Anyone who is currently flouting the, the, the current restrictions or flouts the legislation, I want to see the full weight of the law used against them. And I hope and pray they don't be standing outside an ICU unit while their loved one chokes to death on them. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I call Colin McGrath, Chairperson of the Ex Executive Office Committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today to speak on behalf of the Committee of the Executive Office on what is an important uh, issue for every strand of our society. Uh, for the most part, it is crying out for much greater powers and restrictions to help in the fight against COVID-19. Can I begin by offering my condolences to the families of those that have died as a result of the coronavirus in the North? We have had our third death and we know that this is sadly only the beginning. The scrutiny by Assembly Committees of Legislative Consent Memorandums is usually full and intense. Under normal circumstances, members would have the benefit of a committee report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum to help inform deliberations on whether to grant the Legislative Consent. But with such urgent legislation, this has not been possible. 
There is no doubt that a significant challenge faces us all in fulfilling our scrutiny role in COVID-19 crisis setting. Everything is urgent. Everything is fast moving. Things are changing by the hour. The Committee of the Executive Office has carried out some scrutiny of the provisions of the bill that fall under the responsibility of the Executive Office. It received written briefings from officials on Friday past, and the lead official helpfully offered to speak to members if they needed any clarification in advance of this debate. As has already been outlined, the Executive Office has policy responsibility for civil contingencies. Therefore, Clause 50 and Schedules 21, Part 5 of the Bill give the Department powers in relation to events, gatherings and premises in Northern Ireland. I understand that they will complement the powers to be made available to the Department of Health on the control of infectious diseases and are similar in effect to other provisions in the Bill covering other jurisdictions. The powers will be available for use immediately on commencement, although it is hoped that the voluntary postponement of mass gatherings in response to the outbreak means early use is unlikely. We have already seen many organisations take that life-saving step of postponing events, and they should be applauded for this. The Executive Office will have the power to make and subsequently revoke declarations indicating that the incidence of or transmission of coronavirus constitutes a serious and imminent threat to public health. Where such a declaration is made, the Executive, uh, Executive Office has the power to prohibit or restrict events or gatherings and close premises or impose restrictions on persons entering or remaining inside them. Anyone who fails to comply with the direction will be guilty of an offence punishable by a fine of up to £100,000 on summary conviction or an unlimited fine on conviction or indictment. I sincerely hope that we do not get to that stage. There is a duty on every citizen to comply with directions that aim to protect society during these unprecedented times. I mentioned earlier that a significant challenge faces us all in fulfilling our scrutiny role on COVID-19 crisis setting. In this context, safeguards become even more important to ensure that powers are being properly and proportionately used. So in terms of safeguards, the powers are exercisable only if a declaration of threat to public health has been made by the Executive Office on advice of the Chief Medical Officer or any of his deputies. And the direction is given for purposes of preventing, protecting against or controlling the incidence or transmission of coronavirus or facilitating the most appropriate deployment of medical or emergency personnel and resources in Northern Ireland. What that means is the advice of the Chief Medical Officer or his deputies must be sought before a direction is made. This would appear to be a significant safeguard. Mr Speaker, I now speak to you as a member of the Health Committee and as an MLA for South Down. Much has been said over the last months about this Assembly that it would define us and our collective capacity to, and resolve to work together. This moment and this day can be the define, defining moment of this Assembly. There is no other single issue, not one in a generation, which has brought people together, removed the stain of orange and green politics and seen the need for us all to work together as this issue has. So we are brought to the coronavirus bill which is brought to this House today for consideration. We are told that to effectively respond to this ongoing pandemic, consistency of outcome will be achieved by making the range of tools and powers consistent across the UK. Mr Speaker, I fully appreciate that this is not an easy ask for any of us. The legislation is not perfect and it is not legislation I ever believed that I would be asked to support. But these are extraordinary times. The legislation before us will be time limited for two years and it is neither necessary nor appropriate for all of the measures to come into force immediately or at all. We have the ability with scientific evidence to bring these powers to an early close and I welcome that there are moves in London to have this reviewed every six months and I feel that that would be appropriate. In some of the clauses, Mr Speaker, the emergency registration of healthcare professionals uh, all over the north at present we see doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals graduating early or re-registering so that they can put themselves at the very front line of this pandemic. Let us never forget the debt of gratitude that we owe to them and I hope that any concerns that they have regarding their pension payments 
can be quickly resolved. Pharmacists are another set of unsung heroes. They will have emergency provision to prescribe medicines and drugs they would otherwise not have been able to do. We extend our thanks to pharmacists too who are at the front line of this battle. Other staff and other professions will be able to take blocks of leave up to four weeks at a time as part of emergency volunteering uh, and that will be enabling them to help against the, or to help with this fight against COVID-19. This is critical because the work may very well overwhelm our National Health Service staff and they will need our help, our assistance and we should welcome this provision to allow people to step up to the mark. In terms of PPE, we have many in our health sector who are concerned for their safety. They are at the front line, exposed to this virus day and daily. They need protected and protected properly. We owe it to them for their endeavours to protect them and provide them with the personal protective equipment is a must. But then also, as been mentioned, what of our retail sector uh, and other sectors? They are at the front line, engaging day and daily with people that potentially have this virus and we should consider providing some help or some assistance for them. Uh, in terms of, um, it, it, except Mr Speaker, that there may need to be some reconfiguration of health services uh, uh, within our health network, and I wouldn't question that, but I want an assurance from you, Minister, that any such moves will be temporary, uh, and can I seek from you today on the record that any reconfiguration of health services is temporary and will be moved back again once this passes. In terms of, speaking, uh, or in terms of testing, Mr Speaker, um, this bill is not perfect. There are glaring omissions. I mean, why are we not uh, testing more? I welcome that the Minister made a reference earlier to an increase in testing because we need to ramp up our capability and see an immediate programme put in place within our communities that lets anybody that is worried uh, be tested uh, and then have the results quickly. It is silly to have medical and healthcare staff off sick for 14 days when a simple test with results in 48 hours could let them back onto the wards 11 days earlier. And what of the other essential staff that we are making work? Today, there are teachers in schools looking after children whose parents are day and daily in contact with people suffering from the virus. Can they be tested too? The potential for cross-contamination in such a setting is massive. This bill also gives the Department of Education and, by extension, the Minister the power to direct schools to close temporarily. Unfortunately, it must be said that up to this point, the lack of and confusing information provided to the, by the Department has been unhelpful. My inbox, and I'm sure that of many other members, has been filled with concerned teachers, parents and unions worried about what to do, what not to do, and then how to do it. I hope the Minister of Education will ensure that there is greater clarity, though judging by his tweet last night, I won't hold out too much hope for that clarity. Um, the bill now also brings into force provisions for power in relation to the funding of additional employers' liabilities for SSP incurred as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. Businesses are struggling out there, and the news of recent interventions has been helpful. Mm -hmm. SSP is a concern because most businesses will have people off sick at some stage, and there could be a drain on their financial resources of their business, especially small and medium ones. I also hope that the rumours that there will be some help and assistance for the self-employed uh, will come too as well. And I understand that there may be some announcements in London this morning, uh, and hopefully that will provide some help for our self-employed sector who have been waiting for information. The, there are worrying times, and, and the self-employed do feel a little bit like a forgotten clan, and they've been left to watch their employers get 80% of their wages whilst they face universal credit. As I've said, powers will be given to the public health officers to require potentially infectious persons to go to suitable places to undergo screening and assessment, to remain in isolation and to place restrictions on their travel activities and contact with other people. The Executive Office will be enabled to restrict or prohibit gatherings or events, to close and restrict access to premises during a public health response period. Now, ordinarily, I would argue that it is not the task of this Assembly to prohibit activity. Our task should be to enable people as fully as possible. But as I've said, these are extraordinary times. The Prime Minister has said 
uh, two people or a family unit of living together is constituting a mass gathering. But what is the penalty and how will it be enforced? Will it be the police or will there be other officers? What happens if there's non-payment? By prohibiting gathering or events, I believe we enable more people to survive this crisis. All across the North, we have seen a small section of people disregarding the expert medical advice up to now. They have directly led to the need for the near lockdown scenario that we are currently in. They have not been able to follow simple directions and now have had to be given direct orders. I hope that this will have the effect that is required to stem the spread. And I would add, Mr Speaker, that the vast majority of social media last night was welcoming of these new rules and guidelines, but some were already suggesting ways around it. And I worry that on my travel to here today, I saw that the traffic was lighter, but I don't think that it was substantially reduced. So there are still many people moving around our community, and that does make me worried. I also saw somewhat more people walking to the shop this morning on my journey up than I ordinarily would. And again, I think people are taking the advice to go out, but I hope that they're not going to be going back and forward to the shop all day. We need people to heed the advice. In terms of work and who shouldn't go and who should go, Mr Speaker, I think confusion reigns. What did the Prime Minister mean when he said only essential work in a speech, but then the guideline said only work that can be done, that cannot be done from home? These are difficult times for people and there is much confusion and people such as Boris Johnson need to know that his words will have a massive impact upon families, communities and economies and he needs to choose them very carefully. We need to see urgent clarity on those that can and cannot go to work as this is causing serious stress for people who are genuinely afraid that they will be breaking the rules. Many people have contacted me over the past few days too from far-flung places who are facing lockdown in other countries. I have had people contact me from Australia, Thailand, America and Peru. People are frightened that they may not get home if airports and flights are cancelled. And many young people who are on gap years and the like are working from bar to bar or hotel to hotel to subsidise their travel. Well, that work is completely drying up in other countries. And then with cancelled flights and borders being shut down, they are facing a short-term future that has no income, no shelter and no way out. And we must link as an executive, and I would ask the executive to link with authorities in Dublin and London to do what we can to help people who are facing that peril. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, we have some truly difficult days ahead. Difficult days for this Assembly, for our health and education services, for our businesses, for all the people of the North. But without revisiting the past too much, we have overcome some truly difficult days already. This virus will pass. When it does, when we step out of our homes and back into our meeting places and social circles, when we walk to the gym or our favourite coffee shop again, and when we reach out and shake the hand of a stranger or hug our loved ones close to us again, we will see just what each of us did to bring the dark days to a close. I support and call on the support of all here present for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Steve Aiken. Uh, Mr Speaker, I rise as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party to support the motion and amendment passing the legislative consent motion on the coronavirus bill. And may I also join with others in passing on our condolences to the bereaved. The need for this legislation is unfortunately a regrettable necessity, and we need it to safeguard all of our people here in Northern Ireland. In normal circumstances, a bill of this magnitude and impact would warrant many weeks of detailed scrutiny and would raise a considerable number of questions, not least in its scope and impact. However, these are not normal times, and in view of the global impacts of COVID-19, it is important that we fast-track this necessary legislation to allow our government, our departments and those who provide vital public services the legislative power to do what is required. But the reason we need to do this is not just because of the virus, but also because of the actions of an irresponsible, irresponsible minority who seem incapable of understanding even the most basic requirements of keeping all of us safe. That the simplest of message 
messages, clear though that they are, seems to be missing. Many who think that in some way they are immune or will only be moderately infected demonstrates not only a cavalier attitude to their own health, but selfishly about their family, friends and the very many vulnerable in our society. And for those who think going to an outdoor market at a disused airfield, having a rave on a beach or breaching social distancing at house parties, there is bad news for you. Over a third of those with COVID-19 are under the age of 40. Two thirds are under the age of 70. You cannot say that you have not been warned. It is not indisputable that many are going to die, that many will have their health irreparably damaged, and that only by direct action by everyone that this toll of morbidity will be reduced. I fear that only when the death toll rises will that selfish and ignorant minority realise that they have exacerbated this health crisis, by which stage it may be too late. But even at this late stage, we can change our attitude, our approach, and just by doing the appropriate social distancing, washing hands, not panic buying, and listening to advice, everyone has the opportunity to be a lifesaver. To all those watching and listening, act now and become a lifesaver. Now, turning specifically to the LCM, there are several issues that we are raising about specific parts of the legislation, and our party spokespersons will have raised these issues in committees or directly with the departments, but they are worthy of noting here. In the context of what were to be the two-year scope of the bill, we welcome amendments that have been brought in Westminster yesterday that will review, allow review every six months. Even a cursory examination of the bill shows that it gives considerable powers to the executive and to individual ministers to take actions that could, if not used judiciously, be seen to be taking away rights and liberties that we have all enjoyed. But, Mr Speaker, we are not living in normal times, and hopefully we will be able to step back from many of the provisions within the Act, but we must be prepared, not just for now, but for the medium and the longer term as well. But we welcome the opportunity to revisit this le legislation in six months, as I believe will the people of Northern Ireland who would be rightly concerned if these provisions prevailed unnecessarily. My friend and colleague Mike Nesbitt will re be referring in more detail to some of these issues later on in the debate. But to paraphrase, provisions on mental health, on the registration or should I say re-registration of medical staff, the need to ensure continuity of food supply, restrictions on public gatherings and powers to detain potentially infected people are just some of the areas my party will be paying special attention to over the forthcoming weeks and months. That is to ensure the intent of this necessary legislation is not abused. At this juncture, I and my party would like to give our heartfelt thanks to all our health staff and those across the public and voluntary sectors who have unstintingly risen to the challenge of COVID-19. This indeed shows the best of our society, joined together for us all. It is their spirit, supported by the people of Northern Ireland, that will help us prevail. Finally, Mr Speaker, I would like to direct my comments to the Northern Ireland Executive. Over the last 72 hours, we have now seen a commendable and much-needed solidarity of approach. The Ulster Unionist Party will play its role in making sure that there is strong support for the Northern Ireland Executive. For our excellent Health Minister and his Department, other Government Ministers, Government Departments, on our very system of government itself. We will be tested heavily in the coming weeks, and let us be honest, months ahead. But I and my team across Northern Ireland will help to do what is right for all of our people, regardless of the challenges ahead. Mr Speaker, we support the measure and the amendment. Thank you, and I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to start by placing on record my sincere condolences for this third family bereaved in the last 24 hours. They and all those families affected uh, are in my thoughts. I rise to support the legislative consent motion on behalf of the Alliance Party Assembly team. I do so with some re reticence in principle. Naturally, I regret the trying and already tragic circumstances of this motion and the significant strain that will be placed on our frontline and key workers over the coming months. 
Secondly, it does not come naturally to us as Democrats and as Liberal, Liberals to endorse a bill which places such powers in the hands of the executive, the judiciary and other officials. I have to say my party colleagues and I have significant concerns about some aspects of the bill, even as amended. We have significant concerns about the evident rush behind it. We would certainly have wanted, as many people have said in the Chamber today, much more time for scrutiny and consultation, not least with those most obviously impacted and their representative bodies. However, it is a balance. These are extraordinary circumstances and they requ require extraordinary action. This is a bill of last resort. I wish Mr Speaker quickly to run through the five parts of the bill outlining our support and then raise some areas which we accept are broadly necessary but which will require consider considerable care and caution. First, I wish to pay tribute to officials of Whitehall and here at Stormont who have worked hard to assess the challenges of every change brought about by this bill with the array of consequences arising from them that have to be managed too and also to the executive ministry, ministers who are all operating under incredible pressure. In terms of health, firstly, we recognise the need for, for particular officials to be able to direct people with COVID-19 or showing symptoms of it into quarantine. As we move into what we now hope will be the suppression phase, this will be more vital given we will only be able to lift the restrictions imposed to slow the spread of the virus if we can come to isolate those who have or may have it and enforce this. It is also sensible that these rules are now common across the UK. Secondly, the measures to bring back health and social care workers from retirement while protecting their pensions and also to place medical, pharmaceutical, nursing and midwifery students prematurely into the workplace are extraordinary but sadly will be required. I wish to put on record my and my party's deep gratitude to all of those who have stepped forward. In terms of the clauses to make extraordinary changes to public administration, in general, I feel that they are necessary to allow our frontline workers to focus on caring for our population. Focusing on health on our children, we may reflect at this stage on the extreme challenges being caused to childcare in all senses. Education is being disrupted and childcare restricted. We need to ensure that, the, that this temporary provision for looking after the children of our key workers is properly resourced. Let us work to ensure that children remember this time, this experience of being close to their loved ones fondly, and do not have, to do not have cause to remember the virus that brought it about. In terms of containment, I think we're all glad and even relieved to see containment signed into law. This too is not without complications. It is fundamental in a liberal society that we can congregate in public and we must recognise that we are temporarily suspending that right. We're also placing significant power and responsibility with a few people, none of whom ever really expected nor wanted it. However, the objective here is to make clear what is required of the public and this and how this can be enforced. I turn now to the deceased. Many aspects of this entire situation are distressing and shocking, and none more so than the emergency provisions that may have to be made for burial. We must ensure that emergency measures, while rightly planned for, minimise um, impact on cultural or religious customs. The Act supports the Act provides for supporting people and I welcome the placing into law with the appropriate clarification that they all must apply in Northern Ireland despite our devolved welfare system measures to provide immediate sick pay. It is essential also to, that we protect food supply of course. Community pharmacy and clause 4 of the bill on the extension of prescribing powers for, for pharmacists including those recently retired returning to the profession in this emergency are taking necessary risks right at the front line and we thank them for their professionalism and commitment. As regard healthcare priorities, right now and going forward there will be the mammoth challenge of balancing healthcare priorities. Just as one example, we cannot um, ignore the impact of lockdown on mental health and wellbeing, enhanced in many cases by the amendment to the Mental Capacity Act. This will have huge resource implications as an inevitable consequence of this, 
will be significantly poor mental health across our population. We will also need to be able to scrutinise the safeguards and decisions relating to any forthcoming deprivation of liberty orders. As I come to conclude my remarks, I wish to express my support and admiration for our healthcare professionals and make some points. Firstly, we know that in-hospital transmission is a significant issue, so never has frontline been more meaningful. And this does mean we need to get on immediately with sourcing safety equipment for everyone. We have done it for the police and we must do it for all our health and social care workers, including those who provide the function of domiciliary care who are going from house to house. Secondly, we have to recognise the provisions of the Bill around indemnity and, indemnity and balance those always with necessary safeguards. Sadly, many will make, be making extraordinarily immediate but complex decisions in circumstances few of us can imagine. Assembly, never has it been more important to be clear about how we perform our duties as MLAs. We will need to ensure that we can scrutinise departmental performance fairly and constructively as provisions within this Act are implemented. This, sorry, that we can ensure safeguards are adequate and effective and that most of all we can support all those who need care and all the workers providing it in every way that we can. Committees in particular have never been more vital and all uh, must absolutely continue to operate adhering to social distancing and using technology where possible. I share the desire mentioned by my colleague here, um, Mr McGrath, that the bill moves to, to six months, as the sunset clause moves to six months as opposed to the two years. The derogated powers are there within the bill's drafting for extension if necessary. So in conclusion, this is a monumental challenge ahead of all of us, but I've, I have no doubt the sense of community and determination for which we here are famed will see us through. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Paul Gibbon, Chairperson of the Justice Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I don't intend to cover too many uh, specific issues because I appreciate this is legislation and under your uh, guidance, ministers are to come in regularly uh, where they can to give statements that will give us an opportunity to do that. And Naomi Long did come in uh, yesterday and we were able to go into detail. And I don't want to detain the health minister any longer than is necessary, but I just want to put on record uh, some of the issues that uh, we discussed uh, as a committee. Some of those members in my party will not be allowed to speak in order to give uh, time uh, to get this proceeded as quickly as possible. The committee did receive a briefing and closed session from the department officials regarding what was described. At that stage, a uh, potential legislation being required in light of the then emerging threat from the coronavirus. Uh, the briefing was high level, uh, detailed what exactly would be covered in such a bill. Uh, the detail of which was limited. However, today we are now seeing and considering the legislation. The committee held an additional meeting yesterday to take more detailed evidence from Department of Justice officials on the coronavirus bill. And the committee uh, wants to put on record our appreciation for those officials that made themselves available to do so, given the pressure they are under. Officials gave details of the justice-related provisions of the bill as introduced at Westminster that will be extended to Northern Ireland, and that included information which the Minister has outlined here in the Assembly, temporary modifications to Mental uh, Capacity Act, uh, temporary provisions in relation to registration of deaths and stillbirths in Northern Ireland, provision to spend requirements in Northern Ireland for an inquest to be held with a jury in relation to death from COVID-19, provision to disapply the requirement for an inquest to be held with a jury in relation to a death from natural illness, additional powers in Northern Ireland to act for the protection of public health, including, for example, the, police, the power for police to take a person into custody in particular circumstances, the use of live links in legal proceedings, uh, and powers to enable local government to direct providers in the death management uh, industry. In addition, the committee was advised of potential proposed amendments to the bill uh, enabling the department to make an early release direction that would have applied to certain fixed-term prisoners who fall within the criteria specified by the department. I note that the Ministry of Justice decided not to proceed uh, in including that in the bill that is uh, before us. Uh, officials did, uh, and the minister indicated yesterday, powers already exist. Uh, if we get to the stage when it comes to managing that situation in our prison uh, population. The Minister, worth repeating, indicated 
at all times it will be based upon public safety. There are some people that should not be released uh, during this crisis, uh, and that needs to be the guiding principle when it comes to any potential uh, release of uh, prisoners. In the evidence, the Department uh, all, uh, told the Committee uh, provisions in the Bill would be activated only when it is necessary to do so and on the best available scientific advice, and they will remain in place for as long as is necessary. In addition, provisions can be extended or amended by regulations, but in the case of devolution matters, that this can only be done with the consent of executive ministers. It is a question that I, I, I would ask the Minister if he can just uh, give clarity to. Uh, is there provision for this executive to bring forward emergency legislation if it becomes necessary that falls out with the coronavirus bill that Westminster has taken forward? Is there provisions uh, that would uh, facilitate that if it became necessary? Um, I note that there are schedules to give orders, uh, powers to departments to issue orders. I am just looking for some clarity if those orders only relate to the provisions in the coronavirus bill. We don't know what circumstances could arise, and if it's not covered, I want to know if the executive will be able to action uh, those areas through its own emergency procedures. Under normal circumstances, the committee would have had more time, but these are not uh, normal circumstances. We've seen over the last few days that while many people are being sensible and they are adhering to government's advice uh, in respect of social distancing, as one example, there are those that continue to disregard that advice and behaving in a way that is not only harmful to themselves but to others. These are extraordinary times. The situation is serious. Action must be taken. It is therefore essential that authorities have the necessary powers to keep people as safe as possible. The Committee did seek further detail from officials on a range of areas, including powers for the Department to provide in respect of the early release issue, the implications that that would have had on probation board or indeed even the health service, and how victims of crimes would be notified if any uh, decisions were taken on early release. In respect of social distancing, the Committee questioned officials on what powers the police would have to enforce this and who was responsible for setting the penalties. Committee members appreciate and accept uh, the need for powers in the areas outlined in this legislation, given the times that we are in. A number of committee members did, though, express concern at the two-year limit that would apply to many of the measures provided for in the Bill, and it was suggested, in light of widespread concern, that the powers in the Bill being so extensive that the Government may introduce an amendment to ensure uh, they instead have to be renewed every six months, and, as I understand it, that uh, has been the case. Mr. Speaker, as well as the briefing on the bill, the committee had detailed discussions with officials last week uh, on operational preparation across the justice sector. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, the measures being put in place are absolutely necessary, but many are also sensitive, particularly the death management arrangements. The committee took the opportunity to also discuss the proposed resilience arrangements to ensure that the police service and prison service have the adequate resources to carry out the vital work being asked of them, and they sought assurances that the necessary protective equipment would be available for them. I want to put on record uh, the committee's appreciation for the work that is being done under extreme pressure by staff across the justice system. In particular, the police service, the prison service, the courts and tribunal service, as well as the department itself, many of whom will be also trying to manage their own personal situations. To conclude, in my role as chairman, uh, I want to confirm that the committee uh, formally agreed to support uh, the proposals relating to the justice aspects of the provisions contained in the cor uh, coronavirus bill uh, to Northern Ireland by way of the legislative. Uh, consent motion. Some points, Mr. Speaker, uh, I just wanted to uh, elaborate on uh, slightly further in my role as a member of the Assembly for the constituency of Lagan Valley. Uh, I, I note the Minister, and he is right, when it comes to uh, taking decisions, uh, and he said that we are not blessed with luxury of time, uh, and how true it is. And I know he will be in the Department looking at all of the urgent procedures that are needed to get the testing kits that are available, members have highlighted that, the, the uh, personal protection equipment that needs to be taken. Uh, we, we are not blessed with the ability to go through normal procurement processes. These decisions need to be taken in a very abnormal way, and we understand that. We appreciate that. 600 tests being carried out from today is welcome, but when I look at the calls across uh, the police population, the prison service uh, population, 
uh, and other key workers identified uh, within those that are de deemed key workers, the numbers within their families. We need to be doing so much more when it comes to testing. And wherever those testing kits can become, can come from, they should be being sought. Uh, and I know that the minister will be pressing that these decisions need to be taken in that context, and that normal procurement processes uh, are being set aside uh, to facilitate that. The public do need uh, to listen, and so far the majority have, but unfortunately some haven't. I took calls of a grandmother who brought her grandchildren in to a bank yesterday to open up a bank account. The message isn't getting through. Parents are having to work, and they're giving them to their grandchildren, and they're taking them out on shopping trips to do things that are not essential. So we need to get the message, and that is going to require punitive measures to be taken, because not everybody is sensible in our society, whether that's through ignorance or flagrant uh, abuse of the circumstances we face. And so we're moving to the place where those executive office powers that have been taken to close down events uh, are going to have to be acted upon, uh, and it will have my support in doing so. I recognise decisions as well, Mr Speaker, are being taken outside of normal structures, uh, and uh, we need to, as this develops, to have a, a very clear structured approach from the central government in London, how we are linking with Dublin, how this executive is linking with the other statutory organisations, local authorities. Uh, and I know that there are uh, emergency procedures being put in place already to do that. And my own constituency, uh, Lisburn uh, Council, has been setting up a structured way because there is an overwhelming number of people wanting to volunteer across a wide spectrum of organisations. But when posts go up saying, contact us and we will provide you with help, and once that contact has been made, then those individuals who are well-meaning aren't able to go about actually providing that help. So we need to get the structures in place. And I know the Council uh, will be having a very structured way for community groups to link in. It's important the executive links in with councils and other bodies that do that. I also want to commend those that have stepped up and shown unbelievable leadership in the face of such adversity. I want to commend this minister. I want to commend uh, the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, uh, and all of the executive people uh, that are at the cold face on this, and those that are seeking to advise them, because now is very much the time when that leadership needs to be delivered in a very calm but in a very collected way. Uh, and I want to commend those that are doing that. I want to commend assembly members who are doing that. I know we in Lagan Valley, as a group of five members, uh, have initiated a, a process whereby we can keep in contact to act in unison so that we are not replicating and duplicating our activities. Uh, and in doing that to members, you all have personal uh, issues that you're having to manage and deal with. And I know I heard a broadcast this morning on one of our broadcasters that allowed an individual to tear lumps out of assembly members. And we're all human. And there's been a process of dehumanisation of members that's went on for years. And I know in times like this, people want to blame people. They want to look for a vehicle to channel the anger that some people do have. And I just want to commend assembly members across this House for the resilience that they're showing in the face of very difficult times. And often we don't have the answers, but we're seeking to give the help that we can, as best we can, in very difficult circumstances. I know within Lagan Valley, three of the Assembly members have wives that are in the health service. Mine's been retrained, redeployed, having to supplement staff in a hospital that's been set up as a COVID-19 front line. She's having to do that. She's changed her shift pattern. She's going in and wants to be in. And we're having to put in place the support to make sure our family uh, can care uh, whenever she does that. And that's the case, I know, for other colleagues in the Lagan Valley MLAs. And that's the case for other members here. I know on Sunday night, I left off a freezer to my 98-year-old grandmother. It became very real when you're having to do that. So members are having to deal with personal situations. And that's reflected across so many parts of government and different people that are providing that support. And we need to do it in a calm and collected way, but with an assurance to know that we're doing the best that we can while we manage all of that. So I want to commend everyone that's stepping up and trying to do that. Now more than ever, Mr Speaker, people are recognising what's most important to them. For so long, we've added things into our lives to try and provide fulfilment, contentment. And as those structures have been shaken to its core, we go back to the things that 
really matter to us. It's family, it's friends, and wanting to support them now in this environment that we have. I have family that aren't in this country. They're abroad. Colin mentioned calls that he's taken from Taiwan and Australia. That goes for many of our constituents, many of their families. We're not able to provide that reassurance in a, in a way that maybe we can with our immediate family by making the phone call and getting that contact. And so that's the same for members here as it is for other people. And we do need to see what the support is uh, with the embassies uh, and trying to have that contact and support in place, particularly as other parts of this world go into a uh, lockdown mode. I, I know the Minister, um, we look to him for leadership, and that's a very heavy burden to bear. But I know he, like me, looks above for that leadership and grounds us because of the faith that we have. And for many people, they're searching for what it is that really gives them that support and that structure. For me, it's my faith in God. It may not be the case for other people, even in this chamber. I know it is for this minister. I know it is for other people. Uh, and I've taken comfort as uh, we've been developing in this crisis on a number of verses in the Bible, of which fear not is the most common phrase throughout the Bible. Fear not, fear not, because God knows that it's our nature to fear and to be anxious. And so we constantly are reminded, fear not, for I am with thee. And there's a number of verses that I just want to leave with members and, and with the minister, and with that I'll conclude. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with uh, thy right hand of my righteousness. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to say that I'm praying for you. I'm praying for our ministers, as are so many people across this country at this time of uncertainty that they'll be given the wisdom to try and uh, navigate us through the very difficult times ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you. And I call Kiva Archibald, Chair of the Economy Committee. Um, I rise to speak as Chair of the, the Committee for the Economy. The Committee held an additional meeting yesterday to discuss the aspects of the Coronavirus Bill relevant to the Department for the Economy. In terms of that bill, the committee sought to consider clauses 7 and 8 and the accompanying six, Schedule 6, which look at emergency volunteering leave and the payment for it, as well as conditions around it. Clause 35 and Schedule 15, Part 3, which look at temporary closure of further and higher education institutions. And Clause 36 and Schedule 16, Part 3, which look at temporary continuity directions with respect further and higher education institutions. Unfortunately, due to losing quorum, the committee could only agree to a view on clauses 7 and 8 and the accompanying Schedule 6. The nature of the coronavirus emergency means that the normal timescales and processes around bringing of a legislative consent motion to the Assembly have not been observed. This is far from ideal, as others have um, already acknowledged, and members do have some concerns around this. The committee has put its concerns on record and members acknowledge that we live in remarkable times and the emergency nature of this legislation means that we must accept that this is the way things have to be done. That said, members do consider that the legislation must be subject to review after six months. Clause 7 simply directs to Schedule 6, which makes provisions for the emergency volunteering leave. Clause 8 sets out how payments will be made to emergency volunteers for their loss of earnings and for travel and subsistence. An emergency volunteer will only receive compensation for loss of earnings as an emergency volunteer if they suffer loss of earnings they would not have otherwise suffered. The committee is aware that regulations will be brought forward regarding how the scheme will operate should provide more, should the, and this should provide more detail. However, members appreciate that this legislation has to retain a degree of flexibility as this is an extremely fluid situation. The committee's primary concern is that this scheme will work efficiently and effectively and that no volunteers will suffer any detriment and also will be kept safe. The Department of Health here will be, certifying, will be the certifying authority and emergency volunteers are to be deployed only in health and social care settings and contexts. The certificate will be for two, three or four consecutive weeks and these must be within the same volunteering period. This period of 16 weeks will begin on the day when Schedule 6 comes into force. Further periods of 16 weeks can be specified by the Secretary of State or the Department for the Economy. 
The Secretary of State cannot make regulations for the North on the volunteering period without the consent for the of the Department for the Economy. Any employee taking emergency volunteering leave will retain the benefits of all the normal terms and conditions of their employment, and the volunteer has the right to return to the job that they left prior to volunteering without any loss of seniority. The volunteer will not lose out on any benefits of their employment, including pensions. The Department for the Economy can make relevant regulations, but it can only, rele can only rele regulate where this is within the Assembly's competence and would not require the Secretary of State's consent within an Act of the Assembly. The regulations made by the Department for the Economy will be subject to negative resolution, so a prior annulment can be brought against them. On the basis of this short scrutiny and without time for further clarifications, the Committee for the Economy is content in principle with the aspects of the Bill dealing with emergency volunteering. I would like to just offer some brief um, reflections as, as Sinn Féin spokesperson for Economy. Um, I think that there will be many people out there who may want to offer services as volunteers to, to support the heroic efforts of, of those in the front line in the health service, um, and therefore I welcome the, the provisions in the, the clauses um, in, in respect of emergency volunteers to protect workers' rights and to offer some compensation while, while um, volunteers are in that role. There are some good um, examples of registers of volunteers um, in the South, and I, I would maybe ask the Minister if he would uh, reflect on if those types of measures are being considered here as well. Um, in terms of the clauses on, around further and higher education, obviously in respect of Clause 35, Schedule 15, that has mostly been superseded as universities and colleges have already taken the steps um, to protect the health and well-being of staff, students and, and the pu public. Um, obviously, there are many things that still have to be worked out in, in the respect of that, and we are, of course, working to do that. But at this moment in time, um, our number one priority is protecting lives. Um, also, in respect of the, the continuity plans that are provided for in Clause 36, um, that these should only be undertaken as necessary in consultation with the governing bodies of the institutions and on the basis of expert medical advice to support our vital services. Like others have said, um, normally my reaction would be to oppose many of the measures that are contained within this legislation, but this is an emergency situation and we need an emergency response. And finally, I just want to offer my gratitude to all of those who are battling on the front line um, in the health service and in other services on behalf of us all. And I would implore everyone to take seriously the health advice and the, uh, these measures that are being put in place to protect themselves and their loved ones and all of our loved ones. Gurmilgut. Thank you, and I call Christopher Stalford. Mr. Speaker, before I move to my own uh, remarks, I want to place on the record my condolences to the families of those who are already suffering bereavement as a consequence of this dreadful virus. Mr. Speaker, this country faces the gravest crisis since September 1939, the commencement of the Second World War. And what we heard yesterday from the Prime Minister in his national address was a call to national service. And given what previous generations have endured in the long history of these islands – famine, war, pestilence, the threat of enslavement – a call from our Prime Minister to stay at home, except in certain circumstances, does not, to my mind, seem like too much to be asking people to do. It is clear that this virus is no respecter of person or politics. This virus doesn't care where you put your X on a ballot paper on polling day. This virus is coming for all of us. I think it was the chair of the Executive Office Committee, uh, Mr McGrath, used the term special powers. And this is probably the most far-reaching piece of legislation to come in front of Stormont since the Special Powers Act. It has a very, very far reach. We are a free country, Mr. Speaker, and any loss of liberty in a country like ours, which invented the concept of parliamentary democracy, is counterintuitive. This is the land of John Stuart Mill and John Locke. The people are the master of government in this country, not the reverse. 
There are natural rights to life, liberty and property. But, Mr Speaker, the selfishness of certain individuals has forced the government's hand. Foolish people putting others at risk by their actions has forced the government's hand. The minister is laughing because I sniffed. I can assure you that is not what you think it is. I want to pay tribute to our NHS staff. I also want to thank the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister and the Executive for the work that they have done and that they are doing on behalf of us all. I said at the start of my remarks that this is the worst crisis since the start of the war. In 1940, Mr Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, said, Death and sorrow will be the companions of our journey. Hardship our garment, constancy and valour our only shield, but we must be united, we must be undaunted, and we must be inflexible. That was in the darkness of 1940. We all know that it would take another five years for the sun to rise over Europe again. I know that it won't take five years to win this war if we all play our part. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Dagla Magalier, Chairperson of the DERA Committee. Uh, thank you, Concordia. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee. Uh, however, uh, before I move on to the committee opinion on the clauses relevant to it in the bill, I want to express this opportunity uh, to forward our sympathies to the families of those who have died, uh, not just here, um, but across these islands and indeed across Europe and indeed across the world. I'd like to express uh, our appreciation and gratitude to all those working in healthcare. As I said earlier, we, we owe them a huge am uh, amount, and also we express our gratitude to our frontline workers and indeed to our community sector organisations who are doing wonderful work at local level. Uh, the departmental officials briefed the committee on the clauses that are relevant to DERA uh, on the Thursday and 19th of March, and that's clauses 23 to 27, and schedule 14 regarding uh, the food supply. Officials were able to provide us with a copy of clauses um, 23 to 27 at the meeting. We heard that these clauses concern the provision of information relating to the food supply chain. These clauses provide the appropriate authority, um, either the Secretary of State or DERA, with the power to require information in connection with disruption or perceived disruption to the food supply chain. These clauses apply across Britain and here in the North. Uh, this requirement will apply to any organisation involved in the food supply chain from producer to processor and on to the retailer. And it could, for example, apply to packaging companies or to companies involved in the feed or fertiliser industries. It is meant to apply to companies and businesses that, uh, that, that can substantially affect the uh, food supply chain or who occupy a strategically important place in the food supply chain. However, it will not apply to individuals or sole traders such as farmers. To be clear, there is already a voluntary agreement in place um, between the government and food retailers, and it is anticipated that the information that might be required would continue to be provided on a voluntary basis. If, it is only if that voluntary route does not work that the provisions to uh, require this information would be activated. Activation of the powers would be subject to a commencement order. That, in effect, is the only piece of secondary legislation in these DERA-related clauses and schedules. The commencement of the powers would also require the consent of the devolved authorities, but not the devolved legislators. The committee did question DERA officials about this and expressed some unease with this approach. It was recognised that as um, uh, to be expedient for the circumstances that, that we are in. And the committee appreciates that uh, this LCM isn't following the normal process for legislative scrutiny. And in normal situations, we engage in democratic scrutiny of this legislation, but this reflects the extraordinary challenges that we are facing. We are also informed that sitting underneath this would be a memorandum of understanding between the four legislatures on how this will work in practice. If it is not needed, the committee can, of course, request briefings on the when, how and why this uh, provision and the clauses were activated. We are also informed that it would be rare circumstances when it would be envisaged that these powers would be used. In fact, the officials pointed out that these circumstances were starting to emerge it would likely that they would have to come to the attention of the appropriate authority. The committee asked that the types of circumstances 
when this could happen. And heard one example of when commercially sensitive information was at stake. Some businesses might be very reluctant to disclose that type of uh, information. In terms of sanctions, the committee heard that there could be a financial penalty of up to 1% of turnover for either the non-provision or the provision of false information. This is the level set out in the legislation dealing with the Groceries, code adjudic uh, groceries Adjudicator Code. The committee also asked that the issue on many people's minds, that of food uh, availability, supplies into supermarkets, and the manner in which some people are, are hoarding food, was made clear that these clauses do not deal with this aspect. We also explored with officials what plans were in place to communicate the provisions and powers in the bill to the companies and businesses that would uh, be affected. We heard that since this was predominantly about the, uh, the, the national food chains uh, across Britain and here, the communication would be in the hands of DEFRA. And finally, we explored with officials the two-year sunset clause in the bill and heard that there were already amendments in the House of Commons to put, to put in six monthly reviews. Uh, that's all I want to say as my capacity as chairperson of the ERA committee. Um, I want to just add a few comments on my role as the spokesperson on behalf of Sinn Féin on agriculture and rural affairs. And I will say that I've been contacted a lot by farmers and their families in recent times who are hugely anxious about the implications of this virus for their health and their safety and indeed their, their futures. And I have been contacted also by agents. You know, the, the minister will know that uh, we're approaching the 15th of May deadline, which is a critical deadline for the submission of the single application forms for single farm payments. And whilst a lot of these are carried out online, a lot of our farmers are going to agents, they're going to neighbours, they're going to friends, they're going, uh, they're leaving their farms to go and get these farms uh, completed online. And that requires a meeting up with our people. And that, and farmers leaves that do leave these up until the last number of weeks. So that's something which is causing a great deal of concern for farm support workers and agents. And also the fact that in areas like my own, there is very, very poor broadband uh, in those areas. So it's not even an option to complete the uh, single farm payment application form online because it does, broadband doesn't exist in many of the areas. And indeed, many of our farmers, the average age of farmers is uh, 58 and a lot of them aren't from the, the computer generation and they do, they do need assistance. So this creates uh, extra concerns and, and I have uh, written to the dear minister to consider this as a, a force majeure situation and to look at the range of flexibilities around that 15th of May deadline uh, in terms of the single farm payment. And indeed, uh, regrettably we're out of the EU, but that, the EU requirements no longer apply uh, to that 15th of May uh, de deadline anymore. Um, so th those are challenges, uh, and th again, this is underpinned by a recent announcement at the weekend there of the closure of, uh, of March, and that creates additional financial challenges for our farming community. So there needs to be some flexibility and imagination around the direct payments this year, because this is a force uh, majeure situation. In relation to uh, public health, um, this is a, a big issue as well. Um, it was spoken about earlier by an, a range of speakers the needs for testing, testing, testing. And this too applies to the uh, to rural areas as well. And the Minister will be well aware within his department that, uh, and from his previous role on the, DARD, on the DARD committee, of the excellent work that is carried out through the TRIPSI programme and the Public Health, Health Agency in terms of the farm family health checks, where the, uh, the nurses and the set-up station at March and other locations in rural areas and carry, carry out basic checks for farmers, blood pressure, cholesterol testing and all. Surely we have a model there which can be extended into rural areas to carry out COVID testing in the time ahead as part of this ramp ramping up this testing. And I do note that across the, the south there's 40 test centres. And, uh, you know, and this, is, this is carrying out right across the south of Ireland. So we do ha actually have a model here. And the Minister will know as well that right throughout rural areas there is a range of support organisations who are on the ground doing a lot of work. He will know from his previous role as president of the Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster, indeed in my own role as a GA member and in, uh, in the community sector, there are a range of organisations on the ground doing work. They've got infrastructure which can be very easily utilised at very short notice to turn into test centres to uh, carry out vital testing in isolated rural areas. So those, those options uh, are there. 
So just co a conclusion, um, there, there are a range of issues. Yes, we, we are concerned about the, the pace that this ALCM has been brought in, but we are in extraordinary situations, and I support the motion. And, um, and I just want to just finally conclude it with, with a wee message. Our frontline workers, NHS, shops, and our supply are absolutely crucial. And I also want to mention very strongly as well our community sector. Our community sector is playing a fantastic role at, uh, at ground level, working with vulnerable people, people who are isolated. Uh, they're unseen, they're unheard, they're volunteers. I just want to put on record our deep appreciation for the vital work that they're carrying out at this very, very critical time. Thank you. I call Patty McGlone. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak on this. This is, as the Minister has said, necessary legislation. But before we go there, it, it's incumbent upon us all to send out our message of sympathy to those who have died as a result of the coronavirus and um, indeed wish those who are currently in hospital being treated uh, a good, full recovery. These are difficult times. The legislation is, is necessary, it's vital. Um, indeed, the actions of some have driven us to the point of it being vital. Um, so, uh, one, I don't intend repeating a lot of things that have been said by others. They've said them very genuinely. And this is, this is a cross party, an entire community response, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The one message that is coming across is test, 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 both for key personnel. And indeed, people, I'll give you the example. <clears throat> I was contacted by a nurse over the weekend. She's at home. She has a sore throat. She had a bit of a cold, and she feels like she's recovering now. She's heartbroken that she can't get back in to fulfil her duties in the hospital that employs her. And a simple test could render whether that nurse is able to go back in and fulfil her duties. She sees other colleagues who are off in similar situations and she sees that test could lead to her going back in. She's committed, she's dedicated, she wants to do her best for society at this time, but that simple test not being done is preventing her or otherwise going back into work. So, Minister, I know you're, you're doing your best, and I would give my sincerest thanks to you and to your department for your activities at this time, but that is one key linchpin that is vital to the success or otherwise. Of, of what the health service does over the next while, and indeed other key workers too. Um, <clears throat> the, the second thing I would say in relation to uh, health care workers, frontline staff, medical and domiciliary care workers, is first of all, they're deeply valued by us all at this time. But secondly, PPE. Um, many domiciliary care workers in particular have been in touch with me, very many in fact, to say that PPE and the necessary hand wipes that they require moving house to house, as they provide that social uh, linchpin in communities and support for people who are at home, is not available to them yet. Now, I do know that I've been told just this morning that it may be on its way to them. I hope that is the case, and I would implore that the Minister, I know he will do this, uh, because he's grounded in his own communities and sees it as it is too, that that be done ASAP. Um, the domiciliary care workers are concerned that their views and their worries aren't been reflected back. And the sooner that's done, the better for them, please, if that could be done. Um, <clears throat> now, I listened very carefully to what the Minister was saying about additional powers uh, for the public health agency and a range of powers which is vital. Um, if, you, if the Minister could please uh, advise us if, in fact, those powers will be extended to the likes of, say, environmental health officers and local councils. Uh, the reason for that being is they are probably best placed to evaluate and see what's happening in their locality. Um, I, I'll give you one example, and I'm sure the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs may well be interested in this too, as it's in the agri-food sector. <clears throat> A lady contacted me last night, and I'll read out what she says here. In the past fortnight, the only steps the factory has taken to protect workers is to put up signs about hand washing and install, installing hand sanitizer stations. The buses carrying workers to and from work are not practicing social distance guidelines, and the canteen is also operating with no social distancing being observed. Uh, the enforcement of this is crucial. That lady 
is at home. She has the principal care for her mother. She is the only child. So you can see her mother's not well. You can see what she's going through as to what her husband might or might not bring back into the house. Um, one other thing, and um, I would ask maybe that the Minister check with other government departments, cross-departmental, the Public Health Agency, to ensure that work carrying been carried out for those departments by contractors that social isolation, including the health estates, and I'll maybe speak to you one to one about that later, Minister, that that work has been carried out in accordance with the proper guidelines, because concerns have been relayed to me this morning that contractors and contracts, in some instances, most of them are good, effective workers, uh, but some are simply not complying with social isolation guidelines as they should be. Yep. Forgiving me, and I thank you for raising this point. Indeed, I've had a number of people contact me from very high-profile companies across Northern Ireland in terms of uh, manufacturing this morning, saying exactly what he's saying, that, that social distancing isn't being applied, PPA, PPE isn't being provided, and, and touchscreen computers, keyboards and so on not being sufficiently cleaned on a regular basis, and they are very concerned that there is real uh, possibility of the bug being, being the virus being spread across the manufacturing industry, and I think that message needs to go out. Thank, thanks very much indeed for that, Mr Humphreys. Indeed, uh, the, uh, it's unfortunate that this is coming back to us, but it's a reality that's out there. And the enforcement message, I think as Mr O'Dowd mentioned earlier, the enforcement message must get out there. If it is not being done, people have to be compelled to do it. And if they're not compliant with that, then the necessary rigours of the law must be taken against them. Um, I do see the CEF, the Construction Employers Federation, has come out with a statement this morning around what they would define as the important necessary works, and that maybe gives or distills the situation a bit more effectively for us, because that interpretation of what is what's necessary to one person may not be so necessary in someone else's eyes. Um, I would definitely see health works, um, police stations, and other works of that ilk for, say, the prison service being necessary construction works, definitely. Um, so I'm glad the CEF has distilled that today. Yep. The member for Given Way and his experience is just not in industry, but also in some of those governmental jobs which are not as crucial and urgent at this time. And I would draw his attention to that in the infrastructure department, where at the moment we have traffic wardens that are still on the streets uh, that are engaging with with people as they go about their business, whether it's for pharmacies or essential goods, and also people that are uh, using, um, using their, their car parking machines to put tickets on their car. This, again, is increasing more contact with people. I've asked the Minister of Agriculture to pass on to the Minister for Infrastructure that traffic wardens should essentially be stood down at this time. Uh, they themselves don't want to be putting anybody at risk and themselves at risk in, in doing so. Would the member agree with me? Yes, that, that's very useful, and I'm sure your, your colleague will relay that through, as I will, to the Minister for Infrastructure. Um, we're working through difficult times, and that will require difficult measures, but we're talking about protecting life here, and um, it should not be underestimated the danger of this particular virus. Um, we do need those extraordinary measures, and um, perhaps, too, um, uh, it was mentioned earlier if the Minister could tick tack with the Department for Education. My colleague Colin McGrath referred to it. There are areas where there are very, very high intensities of what are referred to as essential workers. Now, I refer particularly to East Tyrone, where many of those people in the schools or who have children at the schools are defined as essential workers in the food sectors, the, food, the agri food sectors, and domiciliary care. Indeed, one school has been in touch with me. It has left them in an impossible position where upwards of 75% of their pupil intake would fall within that category of essential worker. And that's just not viable for schools. Um, uh, perhaps that I've contacted the Department for Education over the weekend. I haven't heard anything back yet, but the pressure's on them too. Just if that could be relayed, because a situation, a hothouse situation, could be potentially created there, which isn't the aim of what the Department of Education is trying to do. But if the schools implemented it, could be the outcome, and um, if that could be relayed to the to the Department for Education, um, I, I don't intend saying much more, other than just there were many issues have come up that have been touched upon here today. The stresses that this will bring about on the mental health system, 
Um, issues, I have no doubt, issues such as domestic abuse, mental health issues within houses and um, within the homes and the implications of that for children. So I realise there's going to be huge pressures and huge stresses on the department. Whatever support any of us can give, we're there to do that and uh, you can pass on our goodwill to those uh, departments at this difficult time, Minister. Um, just one other thing, and um, this came up at the, the Committee for Justice. There is potential for, uh, on that front, there is potential for uh, early release of prisoners. Um, now, the Minister uh, dealt with that yesterday. That may be under consideration for further down the line. Um, the one thing I would say is just that I want to make sure that if that programme goes ahead, there are many people who are in the prison service at the moment, or in, uh, inmates within the, the prison sector at the moment, who are suffering from mental health problems, addiction issues, and uh, those types of uh, difficulties. I wouldn't want to see a situation where those people with their vulnerabilities are just dumped out in the street, and it would be crucially important that there be a tick-tacking between the health service, which the minister said she, she would undertake to be done, and um, the prison service uh, and the DOJ, obviously, to make sure that that situation doesn't happen and that people find themselves moving from a bad situation into a more difficult situation. So, in conclusion, uh, Minister, I stand, as our party does, to support the legislative consent motion and, again, uh, to convey our sincere support to you, to your department, to the healthcare system for what is going to be difficult times uh, ahead. And we appreciate their commitment and dedication uh, for the entire community at this time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. And I would like to begin by offering my personal condolences to those who have lost loved ones to the virus and also to acknowledge the concerns of, of the broader community at this time. I will be as brief as I, as I possibly can be, and I will also be focused. My uh, remarks are directed entirely at the new powers to be conferred on the executive office. And these are extraordinary powers. Uh, and it would be wrong not to scrutinize them. It would be a dereliction of duty uh, not to place on record that these are very powerful. Uh, new tools being made available to the First and the Deputy First Ministers, uh, and that we should have reservations uh, about them. Uh, and I have reservations in four areas, and if that amounts to me saying that my party gives qualified support to this bill, then so be it. It is a form of yes, but. And I would now like to work through those four buts. The first involves liaison between the executive office and the chief medical officer or his designated appointee. Uh, there are two references uh, in Schedule 21 Part 5 uh, of the bill to the executive office consulting the chief medical officer, paragraphs 35.4 and 41b. Uh, furthermore, there is also a reference to the executive office having regard to relevant advice published by the CMO, uh, and that's at 41A. Now, this is a duty. In other words, it's not an optional extra. They must do this, and that is to be welcomed. But there is no compulsion on them to react positively to the CMO's advice. And you may say to me it's inconceivable that politicians would ignore the advice of the chief medical officer, but it is a joint office, and that makes decision-making difficult, and we know that. We know sometimes the executive office cannot agree. That is a fact. And I'm minded of a time around 12 years ago when I was honoured to be asked by the then First and Deputy First Minister to be one of four people to set up the Commission for Victims and Survivors. And a day early on when a senior civil servant in what was the office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister looked me in the eye with a smile on his face and perhaps too gleefully to be diplomatic said to me, well, you know, Mr. Nesbitt, you're right. You have a statutory right to offer advice to Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness. And yes, they have a duty to listen to you, but they're not under any compulsion to accept your advice. And there's no compulsion in this bill for the executive office to accept the advice of the chief medical officer. I would be much happier 
if on the face of the bill it said the Executive Office's decisions must be informed by advice by the Chief Medical Officer. But in the absence of that, I think it is very important that the advice of the Chief Medical Officer is published immediately and that the results of any consultation between the Executive Office and the Chief Medical Officer are made public immediately. It should not be treated like legal advice which is never published. We need to be open about this, not just because openness is good for its own sake, but openness and communication means the public are better educated and if the public are better educated, fewer lives will be lost needlessly. It's that simple. Fewer lives will be lost if we communicate, communicate and communicate. And on the question of communication, uh, a senior civil servant, as the chair of the, the committee pointed out earlier, engaged yesterday, and I know, Deputy Speaker, it's not normal to name officials, uh, or I believe it's not normal, but I'm going to because these are extraordinary times. His name is Chris Stewart, and since he joined the executive office, I have found him to be open, honest, communicative, transparent, collaborative, not just open to co-design and co-production, but to embrace it. And these are values and characteristics in our civil servants that we need today more than ever before. And I think we should acknowledge that and appreciate it. In the same way, we must appreciate our health service, the cleaners, the tea trolley operators, the nurses, the doctors and the consultants, the people who looked after my darling mother in the last three and a half weeks of her life at the Ulster Hospital and who are now in the tip of the spear in the fight against this, against this virus. The second issue, uh, Deputy Speaker, is the type of event or gathering that the Executive Office might prohibit. Uh, and this is covered in Part 5 at paragraph 37 2. But it's vague. It says either a specified event or gathering or events or gatherings of a specified description. Now, I call this vague. The response I got uh, from Mr. Stewart was that this was deliberately drafted to be broad and flexible rather than vague. And the rationale for that was that what was acceptable last week may not be acceptable this week. What is acceptable this week may not be acceptable next week. And I think that's actually fair enough. But I also need to put on record that I think one person's broad and flexible is another's vague and therefore troubling. There's been a lot of talk this morning about whether building sites should continue to operate. Could a building site be considered under this legislation to be a gathering? Uh, and if so, the executive office could therefore prohibit it. And those responsible could be liable uh, under... Uh, one second. They could be liable uh, under offences, which is paragraph 42.2 uh, of this bill, to on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding £100,000, or indeed on conviction on indictment to a fine which is unspecified and therefore unlimited. I give way. Thank the member for giving way on that crucial point. And, and given the vagueness, and this well, maybe a different wording is what you've got in your email, but would you agree with me that it's that precise vagueness that is actually causing a lot of the widespread uh, confusion among many in the workplace? Because on one hand, they, they take social gatherings, etc., as prohibited, but on, on the other hand, many of them are gathering in the workplace today, um, unable to actually social distance, uh, some of them questioning, is their industry key? Uh, these are questions that are continually coming up, and there seems to be no right and wrong answer. I thank the member for his intervention. My understanding, particularly with building sites, is that if you cannot socially distance, you should not be operating, full stop. So I think that is clear. But I think this idea of what I'm calling vague and what officials are, are, are calling you know, deliberately broad uh, and flexible is a two-edged sword. It does give them the flexibility to say events have moved on from where we are today, but also in terms of communicating clearly to the public, it's not as clear as we would like it to be. And I think we have to accept that that is the situation uh, and there is no perfect uh, in this regard. The third of my four buts is with regard to enforcement. Now, enforcement uh, of prohibitions of these meetings uh, can be carried out under paragraph 41.1 
by either a constable, which is clear, the PSNI, but less clear, the alternative is, by any other person or description of person designated in writing for the purpose of this paragraph by the Executive Office. It seems to me, Deputy Speaker, that's pretty sweeping. Unspecified persons designated in writing by the Executive Office have powers which at 41.2 include the ability to enter any premises and secondly, if necessary, to use reasonable force. Think about that. That means next time we gather in this chamber, one of these other persons or description of persons could enter this chamber and use force to remove one or more of the members of this Legislative Assembly. We have moved that far from normal democracy. I am not saying we should not do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't pass this bill. But I think we must be aware of the enormity of what we are allowing to become the norm. And probably not for the next three weeks, probably more than the next three months. And if we are to give these powers to other persons, and, and let me say the response from the Executive Office is that no consideration has been given to that as yet, but it could be, for example, that we would want local government environmental officers to have those powers as they do in England. The question then becomes, will those other persons be suitably trained? Will they be properly resourced, including personal protection equipment? And crucially, will the public recognize them as having that authority? Or will they resist through ignorance? So again, communication is going to be key if we are to empower others beyond constables to enter premises and to use, if necessary, reasonable force. Uh, my final point is that while there are grounds under paragraph 42 2A for fines of up to £100,000, this appears to apply only to the owner or occupier of premises where an event or gathering has been prohibited or the organiser of such an event or gathering. In fact, at paragraph 37.7, it's actually explicit that this does not apply to a person whose only involvement in the event or gathering is or would be by attendance at the event or gathering. So attendees at prohibited events have no sanction against them. Surely this is a weakness. If we, we think about the gathering on Crawfordsburn Beach that was mentioned the other day, all those who attend do so knowing there is no sanction against them. It's only if you can prove, perhaps through social media, that there was one single source that started spreading the news that we should gather here at a certain time and a certain day. They can be liable, but nobody else can. And surely with these measures that we're putting in place, the inevitability, knowing human nature, is that there will be an underground movement. There will be gatherings. Over the weekend, I watched a documentary about prohibition in America. Al Capone's empire in current money was worth one and a half billion. His personal wealth, 550 million. There are people out there who will be aspiring to make money out of this virus. And surely we should be doing all we can to discourage people who perhaps through an innocent enthusiasm to mix and be, be social are going to gatherings, and yet in this bill there are no sanctions. Deputy Speaker, I, I have no doubt that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister did not get involved in politics to have conferred upon them these drastic powers to restrict freedom of movement and freedom of association. In fact, yesterday, yesterday the Deputy First Minister gave us a very powerful graphic and emotional demonstration of why she is motivated to be in politics. Reacting to the news of the 32-year-old mother from North Antrim constituency is having her chemotherapy stopped because the National Health Service is having to make decisions because of this virus that it was never designed or expected.
to make. This system of government is called consociational, or in other words, we're all in this together. So let's be in this together. Uh, I've been reading on social media today messages from former colleagues in the media, hardened hacks who, who have covered it all from Le Mans, Enniskillen, Shankill, Greysteel, Oma, you name it. They're frightened. They are frightened as never before. And maybe they are looking to us. Maybe they're looking to us to do this together, to show the community that we serve that we can serve them together. So let's lead together. I call Karen Mullen, the Deputy Chair of the Education Committee. I speak today on behalf of the Education Committee. And firstly, like others, I want to extend our appreciation to our frontline staff and key workers, including our school leaders and staff. And I want to pass on condolences to the families of those who have already been bereaved. The Education Committee yesterday considered the relevant aspects of the coronavirus spill at an additional meeting at which a DE official was present, and we thank him for attending that meeting. As already has been said, these are ex extraordinary times, and consequently, the committee agreed to forgo the usual timescales and level of scrutiny for legis legislative consent, of consent motions. The bill prepares permits the Department of Education to close schools and the Department of Health to close childcare settings. Indeed, both departments will also be able to provide directions to each kind of setting in order to permit them to provide continuing services for what the bill calls specified children. Some principals received clarifying correspondence from the Permanent Secretary of Education last week. I have to say that despite this, there is still a lack of clarity from the departments as to how arrangements in schools and childcare settings are going to work during this difficult time. Some principals have com communicated that they are unsure about the number of specified children that will be attending their school. And I'm aware of post-primary schools that opened yesterday with only one or two children attending. They are anxiously awaiting guidance on social distancing, protective measures and testing. The childcare sector has also highlighted the same concerns. It is our responsibility to ensure that guidance is clear and that our schools and childcare sector is supported and protected in the time ahead. Last count, Collier, the bill gives the department quite a lot of leeway in respect of examinations for GCSEs and A-levels. This is another area where further explanation will certainly be required for schools, parents and young people. I think it is important to note that when the situation is resolved, it may then be up opportune to give consideration to our examination system. Last count quarter, notwithstanding any of the concerns that I mentioned, the committee unanimously agreed to support the passage of the legislative consent motion in respect of the provisions linked to education and childcare. I therefore commend those to the House, and I would now like to add a few words as Sinn Féin Education Spokesperson. As members have already alluded to, these are truly extraordinary times. And in times like these, it is often necessary to throw protocol to one side and make uncomfortable decisions. That is what we are doing with this legislative consent motion here today. The experiences of countries around the world, but in particular, the experience of our friends in Italy in the last couple of weeks are stark examples of the heartbreak and the loss that this virus can bring. It is these experiences, along with our duty to protect our people, with influence, which influence our response to this pandemic. As my colleagues have said, we need the public to work with us and heed the advice and stay at home where possible. In normal circumstances, we in Sinn Féin would insist on the most effective and forensic scrutiny of legislation through the procedures available to us. Unfortunately, however, normality is not something 
we have the luxury of right now, and the absolute priority in the time ahead must be to save lives and protect communities. This is why we will be supporting the motion today. I finish with a quote from Seamus Heaney. If we want her this one out, we can summer anywhere. Thank you. I call Martina Anderson. I'll get a, a last can call you and I rise to uh, first of all send my heartfelt sympathy to, to the 10 people who have died um, across Ireland and to the 17,150 people who have died with this coronavirus across the world. I also rise to support this legislative consent motion and I'm conscious of what others have said in this chamber in terms of the reservations that they have. And I would like to express some of our concerns in the context of supporting the legislative consent motion. But as MLAs who are charged with scrutiny and given the extraordinary circumstances that we find ourselves in, when we are interfering with civil liberties, even in extraordinary times and I absolutely concur with the need to bring forward this, these extraordinary measures. Measures as um, I think the Minister and others would know that, uh, that some of us would have liked to have seen introduced a long time ago, uh, a number of weeks ago. But we're rightly concerned with the number of provisions that uh, have been introduced in the Bill. And I too, like other MLAs, have concerns about the sunset clause. And if we look at this through the, the lens of international human rights law, if we look at what's appropriate, what's necessary, and what's proportionate, the bill states, as it's currently in front of us, um, that the powers would last two years. And I know, like many of the MLAs, when when I first read that, I was somewhat shocked because even in a fast-tracked legislation, um, two years is somewhat disproportionate and does without doubt risk extraordinary provisions to deal with this emergency legislation uh, becoming settled law. So I was glad to hear many of the MLAs give expression to their concern um, about that because the sunset law, without doubt, needs shortened. Uh, we are being told now around six months is, is a figure that is being branded about. I still think six months is still long. And, and we do need a mechanism for regular reports back into the Assembly and the committees in slower time um, so that MLAs have an opportunity to do what we are tasked with doing, of scrutinising legislation and measures as they're coming through. I agree with the need uh, of the powers to restrict public assembly. And we heard evidence yesterday of a number of MLAs raising concerns of what was happening in each of our own constituencies. And I agree that the use of the powers in the bill that the Joint First Ministers uh, must declare and issue a declaration of a serious and imminent threat uh, due to the fires, and indeed uh, they shouldn't, and I don't believe they will hesitate in doing so if, uh, if there is such a serious and imminent threat, and I believe that all of the MLAs in this chamber would support them in doing that. This declaration can, however, only be revoked uh, by agreement between the, the Joint First Ministers, and I'm con conscious of what Mr Nesbitt had said when he was outlining his butts um, so I think we need to ensure that it doesn't pass uh, its state of necessity. Um, so it would have been, I think, better, and I think many of us would agree, it would have been better if a declaration procedure had had some kind of renewal periodically built into it, uh, maybe every month instead of what we have at this moment in time. The Executive Office will also be able to designate any person to use, I quote, reasonable force to restrict public assembly. Now, perhaps without such a person 
having training in what's reasonable and proportionate force. So I would say that any such plans uh, to use this must be carefully thought out. And you know that there must be some degree, some degree of training so that people understand what is reasonable and what is proportionate. And I think there needs to be a mechanism of engaging with the committees if, if that is enacted upon. And I also want to deal with the area of detention and deal with potential, uh, potential infectious uh, people. Um, from my understanding, the British immigration officers will have their role extended to deal with those who are potentially infectious. Uh, and currently, however, Minister, that falls outside the law enforcement framework um, in, in, in the north of Ireland. So the immigration officers should uh, be, it should be put sort of fully under the oversight of the police ombudsman's uh, office and maybe the policing board as well. I think that is something that should be examined further in the time ahead without at all interfering with the time frame we're dealing with and making sure we get this legislative support me uh, mechanism um, dealt with today. But it's just to deal with any potential um, abuse of such powers. Um, just like others have spoke, we all have got constituents and people that we know that are truly affected by this. I've had a brother-in-law today who has had his cancer uh, procedure cancelled in, in Altony Gavin Hospital, and I'm sure that many people could bring testimonies to how this is affecting us all personally. And listening to the MLAs, um, there is agreement, I, I would concur, that uh, with all that is said, that we need the earliest review of this emergency legislation. And we need these extraordinary measures rescinded when it is appropriate and necessary uh, to do so. Short, sharp action to deal with this coronavirus is needed. And Minister, I know that the World Health Organization is something that you have referred to and looked at and it's something that I've been following closely because they say, act fast, have no regrets and therefore the call that we have heard for many weeks has been to test, test, test. We need to test, we need to trace, and we need to isolate, and we need to intensify. We're all as MLAs being contacted by people across our constituencies that are doing sterling work, and many of them need that test done to enable them to carry on with their work. And I want to give a particular mention to those carers in our society, those unsung heroes, the care with people who have Alzheimer's and many other illnesses that they're struggling with, people who cannot even, they're not, they don't have any mobility to get out of their beds. I know my family could not have coped if it hadn't been for the, the caring that we got from carers who came into our home, for my mother had Alzheimer's for 17 and a half years, and we cared for her at home. And I, I want to give a particular shout out to those people who need to be tested in order to enable them to go into homes where people are lonely, on their own, and they're the only people coming in to care for them during this very difficult and dangerous time. So I think that all of us would agree that human rights compliance need to be fully restored as early as possible. And so we need sharp and decisive action taken to bring this emergency situation to an end and to return to democratic scrutiny and practice when it is possible to do so. Thank you. Go Members of the Business Committee is arranged to meet today at 1 p.m. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend the sitting until 2 p.m., when the next contribution will, on this item of business will be from Justin McNulty. The sitting is, by leave, suspended. <laughs>